Good evening, guys. Welcome back to the anatomy. Sorry for the missed classes. I was a little bit. I had to travel due to an emergency to the another state, and I couldn't take your classes. But now we'll continue our classes. We are left with a little bit of our syllabus, and hopefully, with the next few classes, we'll be able to finish our anatomy. Okay. So let's just continue where we left. So uh, we were doing the spinal cord, upper motor, and the lower motor in all regions. And now we'll continue with that. OK, guys. So uh, we already talked about upper motor and the lower motor neuron systems. Now we'll talk about the upper motor and the lower motor neuron legions if they have the legions involving your upper motor neuron like the corticospinal tract and the lower motor neuron which is a gray matter anterior horn of the gray matter okay so important thing is you have to see uh the like you know uh, what is how to differentiate between the upper motor and the lower motor neuron legion always remember a lower motor neuron legion okay it will always re results in the hypoactive muscle 
uh, stretch reflexes and a reduction in the muscle tone causing the flaccid paralysis or the hypotonicity because we know that the uh, lower motor neurons they are providing the motor component to your reflexes as well as to the muscle that's why you have loss of tone and decreased reflexes with this okay so you will have the suppressed muscle stretch reflexes as well as you will have the absent muscle stretch reflexes associated with the lower motor neuron symptoms other than that you have the muscle fasciculations which are either the twitches or the tasticulation of the group of the muscle fibers and you can visibly see the those twitches in, around your mouth around your face around your body which is in the lower motor neuron legend okay sometimes later on it can <coughs> sorry it can even develop the fibrillation which you can detect using the electromyography muscles which are innervated by the motor uh, like lower motor neuron ligands these muscles they undergo the wasting and they undergo the atrophy so muscular atrophy is also a side effect of the lower motor neuron symptoms one of the symptoms so you have uh, these uh, this is known as a flaccid paralysis where you have the absence of the reflexes fasciculations of the muscle atrophy flaccid paralysis okay and usually lower motor neuron ligands produces a flaccid paralysis ipsilateral same side and at the level of the ligand upper motor neuron ligands is the ligand of the corticospinal tract so we know that corticospinal tract actually provides a inhibitory effect on the muscle stretch reflexes that's why like what happens they make the deep tendon reflexes or the muscle research more hyperactive or hypertonic so that inhibition from the upper motor neurons is lost that's why it becomes hyperactive or the hypertonic so your muscles will be hypertonic and reflexes will be hyperactive it can cause a rigidity of your uh, body that is postural flexion of your arm and the extension of the lug can cause the rigidity okay uh, or it can cause the decerebrate rigidity decerebrate rigidity means the postural extension of the arm and the lug will occur with the rigidity okay so if you have the lesions above the level of the midbrain that always produces the decorticate rigidity okay decorticate we talked about it there's flexion uh, of the arm and extension of the leg and lesion below the level of the midbrain will produce this decerebrate rigidity okay involving the upper motor neurons upper motor neurons uh, like uh, will also result in the atrophy of the weak muscles but it occurs as a result of the disuse other than that uh, you have a uh, upper motor neurons reflex is associated with the babaski sign the babaski test if how do you perform you stroke the lateral surface of your sole of the foot with a painful stimulus normally there is plant reflection of the big toe with the fanning of the little toes what happens with the lesion of the corticospinal tract the babaski sign is present or the babaski reflex is present babaski reflex is normally seen in the infants first year of the life but in the corticospinal tract lesion or the upper motor neuron lesion you can have the babaski sign in adults also which is characterized when you do the stroking of your sole of the toe it causes the extension of the toe and fanning of the other toes in the upper motor neuron lesion two type of the reflexes are lost abdominal and the cremastic reflex are lost okay this causes what is known as the spastic paralysis which includes the atrophy of the scalpel muscle increased or hyperactive reflexes and altered cutaneous reflexes upper motor neuron lesions causes the spastic paralysis which is either ipsilateral or contralateral and below the level of the lesion okay now let's talk about this upper motor neuron lesion you see this lower motor neuron it is providing the motor innervation to the skeletal muscle okay and now this is the upper motor neuron coming from the cerebrum these fibers they descend downwards they uh, they cross to the contralateral side at the level of the lower medulla okay known as a pyramidal decussation then they descend along the spinal cord and provide this inhibitory innervation to the lower motor neurons so if you have the lesion at the level of the a you have the spastic paralysis of the upper motor neuron and it will be contralateral below the level of the lesion why contralateral because it is crossing to the opposite side then <coughs> a and b now c is the contralateral so you have the spastic paralysis of the upper motor neuron lesion like ipsilateral and below the level of the lesion now at the level of the d and e you have the flaccid paralysis lower motor neuron lesion which is ipsilateral at the level of lesion so these are the features you have the spastic paralysis in the upper motor neuron lesion <coughs> sorry you have the hyperflexion you have the babenski sign you have the increased muscle tone class like rigidity disuse atrophy decrease speed of the voluntary muscle large area of the body involved 
Lower motor neuron will have the flaccid paralysis, decreased reflexes or the absent reflexes, Nobabansky sign, fasciculations will be there, decreased muscle tone or atonia, atrophy of the muscles, and the loss of the voluntary movements, a small area of the body is affected with the lower motor neuron lesions. Now let's talk about the sensory pathway. We have two types of the sensory pathway. One is the dorsal column, medial meniscus pathway, and other is the spinothalamic uh, system. Okay. They use three neurons to convey the sensory information from the peripheral receptors to the conscious level of the cerebral cortex to the brain. Okay. Now, the first sensory neurons, it will go, it will innovate the receptors. Okay. Now, these receptors, they have a cell body within the dorsal root ganglia. We already talked about it, the dorsal horn. You have the dorsal root ganglia and they carry the information to the spinal cord in the dorsal root of the spinal nerve. The first neuron that synapses with the second neuron and goes to the brainstem level or the spinal cord. And then the axon of the second neuron crosses the midline and is carried in a track to the CNS. Now the axon of the second neuron that synapses on a third neuron which is present in the thalamus. So first we have spinal cord or the dorsal root ganglia. Then after that it goes uh, at the level of the spinal cord of the brainstem and then it is at the level of the thalamus. Now the axons of this third neuron goes and goes to the somatosensory cortex of your cerebellum, cerebrum. Sorry. Now this is the sensory pathways. So you, I told you there are three neurons, neuron one, two, three. This is the first neuron, which is bringing these sensations from the peripheral receptors and its cell bodies that are located in this dorsal root ganglia. Okay. Then it will go, it will innovate these uh, uh, neurons and it will innovate these uh, neurons uh, like, uh, uh, or uh, they will interact with these neurons in the, uh, like uh, the second order neuron, which is usually in the spinal cord at the level of the brainstem right then these will cross to the contralateral side and they will go to the third neuron which is present in the thalamus and then the axon of the third neuron will go and it will interact with the primary somatosensory cortex which is in post central gyrus so we have first order neuron in the sensory ganglia second order is in the cns and the third order is in the thalamus now talk, let's talk about the ascending pathways now these ascending pathways we have two types dorsal column middle meniscus and the spinothalamic tract dorsal column middle meniscus carry the discriminatory touch conscious proprioception vibration and pressure very important and uh, spinothalamic carry the pain and temperature sensation we have three neurons first neuron cell body is in dorsal root ganglia second one it decussate here in contralateral to the outer side and the third one is the thalamus and usually the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus now let's talk about the dorsal column middle meniscus pathway the dorsal column physical pathway they carry the sensory information including the discriminated touch joint position like where is your joint in the environment where is the position of your joint you know that your particular joint is, is here or there this is because of that that is known as a proprioception then we have the vibratory sensation and the pressure sensation from your limbs and trunks the afferent they have their cell bodies, primary order neuron in the dorsal root ganglia. Then they enter the spinal cord, okay, in the form of the axons of the dorsal root, uh, these nuclei in the dorsal root ganglia, which they, where they call it is heavily malinated dorsal root fibers, okay. Then these dorsal root fibers, they collapse together and form known as the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. These are the tracts present in the dorsal part of your spinal cord, okay. Then uh, fasciculus gracilis, they are found at all the spinal cord level. It is situated closest to the midline. So medial one is the fasciculus gracilis and it carries the input from the lower extremities and lower trunk. So fasciculus gracilis is medial. It carries sensation for the lower extremities and lower trunk. Cuneate is more lateral. It carries the upper part and the cervical spinal cord level. Okay. So it carries the upper trunk and the upper extremity, the sensory information. Then both of these fasciculi, they form the dorsal column of the spinal cord. You must have heard the dorsal column of the spinal cord. This is from this fasciculus gracilis and cuneus. Now they carry the information and they ascend along the spinal cord to reach the second order neurons, which is in the lower part of the medulla. Then what happens in the lower part of the medulla? These fibers of the fasciculus gracilis and the cuneus, they synapse with the second order neurons, which is in the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus. In the, uh, mid, in the medulla, lower part of the medulla. Cells in, mid, in these medullary nuclei give rise to the fiber that then cross the midline no, uh, and these crossing fiber known as the internal arcuate fibers. Then the ascent goes to the brainstem in the medial laminiscus. So now when they ascend upward, they are known as a medial laminiscus. 
Now fibers of the medial meniscus goes into the thalamus, usually the VPL nucleus of the thalamus. From the VPL nucleus, thalamocortical fiber, they will project to the primary somatosensor area in the postcentral gyrus located in the parietal lobe. So you can see here, we have the receptors and we have the first order neuron. The cell bodies of the first... <coughs> Sorry, the cell bodies of the first order neurons, they are in the dorsal root ganglia. These goes, these innovate these peripheral receptors like the Pacinian corpuscle, which, which, uh, which, uh, which is responsible for vibration sensation, Meissner corpuscle, which is for touch, muscle spindle, which is for proprioception. Now, they are their axons. Now, they go in, also known as a dorsal uh, root nerve or dorsal root nerves. These go on in the spinal cord, right? And as they go on spinal cord, they form what is known as the, they, they combine together, coalesce together, known as the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Now, in the, uh, like uh, we already talked about it, uh, this is the upper part of the spinal cord. This is a shaped thing. Here, the medial part is known as the fasciculus uh, gracilis and the lateral part is known as the fasciculus cuneatus. This fasciculus gracilis, they carry the sensation from the lower limb below the level of T6 and fasciculus cuneatus, which is more lateral, it carries the upper limb from T5 and above. Okay, this is the lateral column. This is the medial column. Then these, both of these columns, they are together known as the dorsal column. Now together, they are known as a dorsal column. This goes into the medial part of the medulla. Here, they will interact with the uh, synapse with the second order neurons whose cell bodies they are located within this nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. So fasciculus gracilis goes on the nucleus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus goes to the nucleus cuneatus. Now the axons from these uh, nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus, they will they will cross to the uh, contralateral side in the form of the internal arcuate fibers. They go and they synapse and now they will be known as medial laminiscus. And these medial laminiscus, they will synapse in the thalamus, anterior posterior lateral nucleus. Now in the thalamus, this medial laminiscus, these fibers, they will ascend upwards, okay? And as they ascend upwards, these are known as the, what these are known as the, these are actually known as now thalami, okay? So these fibers are known as the, they are going from thalamus to the cortex, thalamo cortical fibers. Now these will ascend and go to the primary somatosensory area, which is in post-central gyrus. So they carry the conscious, fine touch, vibration, to point to uh, like uh, discrimination. Now, Legends, if they are at the level of, wait. So if you have legions at the level of A, B, and C, because they are crossing to the legion, so they will cause the contralateral and below the level of the legions, they cause the sensory loss. And D will cause the ipsilateral and below the level of the legions, all of these sensation losses, like proprioception, fine touch, vibration, and the pressure. Okay. Now let's talk about the legends of the dorsal column. Now we know they carry the sensation of vibration. Position sense, pressure sense, is two point discrimination. Now, there is loss of the ability to identify the characteristics of an object, like known as the astrognosis, which is the size. You cannot find the size, consistency, form, and the shape of the object using the sense of the touch. If you want to check the dorsal column medial laminous track, you do the uh, vibratory sense using a tuning fork. Now, Romberg sign is tested by asking the patient to place their feet together. If there is marked deterioration of the posture, that is the patient's face with the eyes closed, this is the positive Romberg sign. It is such as the legends of dorsal columnan or the dorsal root of the spiral nerves. With the eyes open, the interruption of the proprioceptive fibers, okay, carried by the dorsal column can be compensated by the visual input of the cerebellum. Therefore, you maintain the balance. So, if you have the patient who even disturbs the balance with the eyes open, then this is the cerebellar damage. So if you have the eyes closed, that is the damage in the dorsal column. If you have the eyes open, that is the cerebellar damage. So you can see these are the fibers coming into the spinal cord. These are ascending. The medial one is known as the fasciculus uh, gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus. Okay. From the lower, uh, lower part of the body, T6 and the below, these are the fibers that are coming, carrying the sensation. And these forms the fasciculus gracilis. From the upper part of the body, these forms the fasciculus cuneatus. Together, these come in the second order neuron, uh, uh, the second order neuron at the level of the nucleus cuneatus and the nucleus gracilis here, lower part of the medulla. Then they will decussate in the form of the internal arcuate fibers, and now they are known as a medial laminiscus. Medial laminiscus will go to the VPL nucleus of the thalamus and primary somatosensory cortex. So these are the dorsal column medial laminiscus. Now let's talk about the spinothalamic tract. 
Now spinal thalamic tract creates the sensation of temperature, pain, and the crude touch from the extremities and the trunk. Now they have their now the sensation same thing. The first order neuron, the pain and temperature fiber, they have their uh, cell bodies within the dorsal root ganglia, and they enter the spinal cord. Okay, by the dorsal root fibers, their fibers they will ascend. Usually after entering, they does not go directly, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, yeah, spinal cord, to the gray matter of the spinal cord or to the dorsal column. These fibers, they actually descend or ascend a couple segments in the dorsal lateral tract of Lissor before they enter and synapse in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So they will go to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Okay. But before them, they will usually ascend one or two segments. That's why all the lesions of the spinal cord, they are present the lesions. Whenever you have the lesions of this anterior spinal thalamic tract or the spinal thalamic tract, they have the lesions one or two segments below the level of the spinal cord because these are ascending one or two segments above. Okay. Second order neurons, again, they are present in the dorsal uh, horn of the gray matter. The axons from these cells, they cross in the ventral white commissure. So here the fibers, they are not crossing at the level of uh, medulla. They are crossing at the level of the white matter of the brain, known as the anterior white commissure, below the level of the canal of the spinal cord. And they will coalesce together to form the spinothalamic tract in the ventral part of the lateral uh, funiculus. The spinothalamic tract then coats the entire length of the spinal cord. And then they go to the brain stem in the VP nucleus of the thalamus. Cells in the VP nucleus of the thalamus, they send the pain and temperature sensation to the primary somatosensory cortex in the postcentral joints. Now, this is the um, a receptor carrying the pain and temperature sensation. Their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglia. Now, as the fibers enter, they, they does, does not go to directly go to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They will ascend in the form of the Lissot tracks, one to two segments of the spinal cord, and then they will uh, go and synapse in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Then they will cross here in the form of the anterior white commissure, go to the contralateral side within the spinal cord, and then they will ascend as the spinothalamic tract goes to the thalamus, VPN nucleus, same, and then to the postcentral gyrus. So they ca carry the sensation of pain and temperature. Now, if you have the lesions at A, B, or C and D, even at the level of the spinal cord, because decussion is occurring at the level of the spinal cord, where it's entering the dorsal horn, so you will have the lesions always, spinothalamic tract lesions will be contralateral despite their location and below the level of the lesions. Always. So you can see these are the fibers. You can see as they are coming, they're ascending and then going to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Then immediately within the spinal cord, they are going to the contralateral side. Similarly, here, contralateral side, VPL nucleus, and the spinothalamic tract. The third type of the pathway, which is not very important, is the spinal cerebral tract ray. They carry the unconscious proprioception input, usually from the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendal organ to the cerebellum, and they help to monitor and modulate the movements. Two types, we have the dorsal and the cuneus cerebellar. Dorsal carry the input from the lower extremity and the lower trunk, and the cuneus cerebellar, they carry the proprioceptive input to the cerebellum from the upper extremity and the upper trunk. The cell bodies of these are located in the class nucleus, which is the spinal cord from the T1 to L2. Now, the cell bodies of the cuneus cerebellar tract Okay, they are found in the medulla in the in external arcuate nucleus. They are not very important. Now, the lesions that affect the spinal cerebral tract, they are very uncommon. And these are associated with the hereditary diseases, which is where there is a degeneration of this spinal cerebral pathway. The most common is the Friedrich ataxia, which you will read. It's an autosomal recessive trait. Cerebral, the cerebral, the spinal cerebral tract, dorsal corum, spinal, corticospinal tract, and cerebellum may be involved in the Friedrich ataxia. And you have the ataxia in their gait is the most prominent symptom of this disease. You can see from the lower limb, from the muscle spindle, they go to the dorsal root nucleus and they enter and go to the spinal cord clock nucleus synapse here. Then through the dorsal horn, they, they goes up in the form of the dorsal spinal cerebral tract, passes the inferior, inferior cerebral peduncle and goes to the cerebral cortex. Similarly, from the upper limb and from the muscle spindle, dorsal root ganglia, it goes to the external cuneate nucleus and then ascends at the cuneocerebral tract. So these are the two types of the tracts. So in this image, you can see there is lots of things. A, I told you the medial one is always the nucleus, a fasciculus, gracilis. The lateral one in the dorsal column will be the fasciculus cuneatus. So fasciculus gracilis, fasciculus cuneatus, right? This is the corticospinal tract. This is the spinothalamic tract, which is more lateral. This is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This is the, uh, this one, uh, like, uh, uh, e is the this uh, dot uh, the, sorry. E one is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This is the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The G one, okay. 
now we have the brown sequer syndrome brown sequer syndrome we do the hemi section of the spinal cord which results in the lesion of three main neural system it causes damage to the corticospinal tract dorsal column and the medial meniscus pathway and the spinal thalamic tract now they will produce two ipsilateral sign and one contralateral sign so lesion at the level of the spinal cord because you know corticospinal tract was decussating at the level of the lower medulla pyramidal decussation so all the lesions that occur uh, to the corticospinal tract at the level of the spinal cord they will be ipsilateral so the lesions of the corticospinal tract will produce the ipsilateral paresis below the level of the injury lesion of the fasciculus gracilis and the cuneus will also cause the ipsilateral loss of the vision tactile stimulation and vibratory sensation below the level of the region but as we know spinal thalamic tract it as it enters the spinal cord cross to the contralateral side so it produces the contralateral loss of the pain and temperature one or two segment below the level of the region this is known as a brown sequer syndrome also at the level of the region you will have the all the loss of the sensations including the pain and temperature as well as placid paralysis due to the injury to the these alpha neuter uh, lower motor neurons or the alpha motor fibers now if you have the lesions of the spinal cord above the level of the spinal cord uh, like above the level of the sacral spinal cord uh, this is known as a, this results in the spastic bladder this is due to the loss of the inhibition of parasympathetic fiber that innervates the detrusor muscle during the parent stretch thus the detrusor muscle will respond to a minimal amount of the stretch causing the spastic bladder and leading to urge incontinence now this picture is important you will know the different types of the symptoms here now after the spastic bladder we have the atoric bladder if you have the lesion at the level of the sacral spinal cord segment or a spinal sacral spinal cord root it will result in the atonic bladder because there will be loss of the spackling innervation with the loss of the contraction of the detrusor muscle and you have a full bladder with a cortinous dribbling of the urine atonic bladder at the level of spinal cord above the level of the sacral spinal cord spastic bladder now polio polio disease actually causes the damage to the anterior horn of the spinal cord so it causes the lower motor neuron lesion like the flaccid paralysis muscle atrophy fasciculation air flex and most commonly it involves the lumbar level tabes dorsalis usually causes the damage to the dorsal root of the spinal cord so that is the dorsal column medial meniscus tract is involved so causes the paresthesia pain polyuria it is associated with the late stage of syphilis patient have the positive rhombus sign because of the dorsal dorsal column they will sway with the eyes closed argil robertson pupil is seen with the tertiary syphilis and suppressed reflexes will be seen at uh, this level als amyotrophic uh, scanner necrosis they will have the both the upper motor and the lower motor neuron lesion here a in the als you will have the spinal muscular atrophy usually of the anterior horn but it also causes the lateral sclerosis that is also damage the upper motor neuron lesion that's the corticospinal tract so you will have the spastic paralysis in the lower limb increased tone on the reflexes and flaccid paralysis in the upper limb so both the upper and the lower motor neuron lesions are seen here then anterior spinal artery will involve all this anterior part of the spinal cord so here only the dorsal column which is these they are spared all other signs they will be bilateral and it is usually at the level of the mid thoracic so spastic bladder will also be there then as i told you poliomyelitis it is due to the destruction of the ventral horn of the motor neurons caused by the polio virus this causes the flaccid paralysis hyperreflexia hypotonicity okay it can lead to the muscle atrophy and permanent disability ALS also known as a Lou Gehrig disease it is a more disease because i told you it affects both the upper and the lower motor neuron disease usually it begins at the level of the cerv cervical level of the spinal cord and then uh, progresses up or down the cord patient with a bilateral flaccid weakness of the upper limb and the bilateral spastic weakness of the lower limb so you have the flaccid weakness of the upper limb and the spastic weakness of the lower limb lower motor neurons in the brain stem and the nuclei may also be involved later then we have the vitamin b12 deficiency or the pernicious anemia subacute combined degeneration you can remember it is like that as cd so it involves the spinal cerebral tract cortical spinal tract and these are dorsal column usually involves the upper and the lower cervical uh, cervical cord level syringomyelia is the presence of the cavity within the central canal of the spinal cord here the most commonly involved fibers is the spinal thalamic tract because when they are crossing in the form of the anterior commissures so you will have the loss of the pain and temperature bilaterally as the disease can progress it can also involve the this anterior horn of the spinal cord and can cause the flaccid paralysis atrophy of the upper limb muscles due to the destruction of the ventral horn cells brown sequer syndrome we already talked about it it causes ipsilateral loss of the position and the vibration at and below the level of the region spinal thalamic tract contralateral loss one or two segment below the level of the region and uh, we have the paresis below the level of the region flaccid paralysis at the level of the region and sometimes it can involve the descending hypothalamic fibers causing the uh, horner syndrome that is a ptosis meiosis and anhydrosis 
last is the occlusion of the anterior coronary artery we know it interrupts the blood supply supplying to the anterior uh, ventrolateral parts of your spinal cord so it involves the spinal thalamic and the corticospinal tract the patient will have the spastic paralysis bilateral and bilateral loss of the pain in temperature syringomyelia i told you there is a cavitation of the central canal of the spinal cord there is loss of the bilateral pain in temperature uh, temperature sensation usually involves the upper part cervical part of the spinal cord involving the hands and the forearms when the cavity will expand it can also lead to the compression of the ventral horn of the spinal cord so lead to the bilateral facet paralysis of the upper limb one of the manifestations later on is the horner syndrome which occurs due to the involvement of the descending hypothalamic fibers and causes the meiosis tosis and anhidrosis then tapis dorsalis is seen with the neurosyphilis it causes the destruction of the dorsal column okay and dorsal roots of the spinal nerves they cause the impaired vibration position astrognosis proximal pain ataxia as well as the decreased reflexes and incontinence patients they are Uh, because of they have loss of the proprioception they are unaware of where the ground is and how to walk and they have a practice characteristic walk known as the they have a characteristic known known as the high high step stride they have abnormal pupillary response known as the rg robertson pupil rg robertson pupil means the they, they they can respond to the accommodation but not to the right reflex Now, subacute combined degeneration, vitamin B12 deficiency seen with the pernicious anemia, damage to the dorsal column, corticospinal tract, resulting in the bilateral paralysis and bilateral alteration of the pain, temperature, and pressure, pressure sensation with the level of the liver. Okay. Now let's talk about the brainstem. Now we know brainstem contains of the three parts. We have midbrain, we have the pons, and we have the medulla. Midbrain begins just below the level of the diencephalon. in the middle we have the uh, the most upper part is the midbrain then we have the pons in the middle uh, which our lies the cerebellum and medulla okay which is present cordial to the pons and it is continuous with the spinal cord at the foramen magnum now brain stem is very important because it's the site of origin or the termination of the fibers in the nine cranial nerves so nine cranial nerves they arise or their fibers terminate in the brain stem Now two cranial nerves, oculomotor and the trochlear, third and fourth, they arise in the midbrain. Remember, four trigeminal abscess and facial vestibular cochlear, they enter or exit at the level of the pons. Three vagus glossopharyngeal and the hypoglossal, they enter or exit at the level of the medulla. Now remember, accessory now are the cranial nerve eleven. Their fibers arise from the cervical spinal cord. Now you have to remember what you will found in the different level of the spinal cord. These levels are very important sections. now remember all of them in the upper part of the midbrain so upper midbrain what do you have midbrain which cranial nerve we have the cranial nerve third and fourth right so you will have let's talk about the tract first you have the corticobulbar tract you have the corticospinal tract in the lateral you have the spinothalamic tract now you have the medial geniculate body at the level of the midbrain you have the dorsal column medial meniscus you have the red nucleus the tracheal nigra not very important cerebral peduncle not very important also at the level of the upper midbrain you have the superior colliculus now this is the periaqueductal gray matter of the spinal cord not very important and its center we have the cerebral aqueduct not very important and you can see the cranial nerve third and its nucleus that is the adinger westphal nucleus they are located at the level of the upper midbrain then at that part at the level of the lower midbrain you have the cranial nerve fourth so here you have it's a lower midbrain you have not the superior but the inferior A colliculus. You have the trochlear nucleus. That's the cranial nerve fourth. Now you will see the medial meniscus here also. You will see the cortical spinal cortical bulbar tract, spinal thalamic tract. Along with this, you have the descending hypothalamic fibers. Also, you have the medial longitudinal fasciculus at the lower midbrain level. Now let's talk about the middle pons level. In the middle pons, you have only the cranial nerve five. In the middle pons level, you have the you you can see this cavity on the fourth ventricle. Now you have the main nucleus of the cranial nerve five. as well as the motor nucleus of the cranial nerve five the motor nucleus is the medial one then you have the corticospinal tract corticobulbar tract medial meniscus spinothalamic fi uh, fibers and its descending hypothalamic fiber and the medial longitudinal fasciculus so this is at the level of the middle pons lower pons you have the cranial nerve six and cranial nerve seven now you can see there is nucleus of the cranial nerve six 
now you have the nucleus of the cranial of seven. That is a facial nucleus. Now, corticus malleus, cortical bulbar tract, medial lamineus will be here. Superior olivar nucleus is at the level of lower pons. Spinothalamic and resonic fiber will also be there. Now, at the level of the spinal, this uh, uh, but the lower pons, you will also have spinal tract and the nucleus of the cranial of five. Okay, so another nucleus of cranial of five. Also, you'll find the dentate nucleus here at the level of this. <coughs> now, <coughs> this cranial nerve seven, you can see it forms a kind of loop around the nucleus of the cranial nerve six. You can see it is looping around like that. Like the nucleus, it is looping like that. Okay. So this leucus is very important. It forms the genome of the facial nerve. Then moving on the medulla so we have an open medulla and a closed medulla level open medulla you will have most medially the medial longitudinal fasciculus you have the hypoglossal nucleus cranial nerve 12 you have the dorsal motor nucleus of the cranial nerve 10 and you have the solitary nucleus and the tract other than that you have the spinothalamic tract spinal tract on the nucleus of cranial nerve 5 okay you have the uh, nucleus ambiguous here inferior olivary nucleus medial lamineus and the cortical spinal tract is also found here now at the closed medulla level you will have the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneate spinal tract of cranial nerve 5 you have the spinal nucleus of the cranial nerve 5 spinal thalamic tract and the descending hypothalamic fab descending py pyramidal decussation that is the crossing of the cortical spinal tract is at the level of the lower medulla or the closed medulla and you can find the internal arcuate fibers which forms the medial meniscus at the level of the closed medulla like the spine uh, like uh, this uh, dorsal column they cross here at the level of this now let's talk about the functions of different type of the cranial nerve olfactory it is for smell if it is lesion it causes the loss of the smell anosmia optic nerve it is for seeing it can cause the visual field effect anopsia it can cause the loss of the light reflex with the cranial nerve third uh, if cranial nerve third is also involved and only nerve affected by the multiple sclerosis is the cranial nerve second cranial nerve third is motor it supplies the motor innovation to the muscles of the eye that is the superior rectus inferior rectus middle rectus inferior and uh, it also raises the uh, like uh, eyelid by supplying the elevator papillary superioris it supplies the superior pupillae causing the pupillary constriction and the accommodation using the ciliary muscles injury can cause the diplopia external strabismus Tosis, dilated pupil, loss of the right reflex in, along with the cranial nerve third and the loss of the near response or the accommodation. Now let's talk about the cranial nerve fourth, trochlear one. It is the motor nerve that supplies the superior oblique that depresses and abducts, abducts the eyeball. Now weakness, so it causes the eye to look down and out. So the, there will be weakness if there is a lesion uh, looking down and with the adducted eye, there will be trouble going the downstairs, head will tilt away from the lesion side. Trigeminal, we have trigeminal first part, second part, third part. The first part is the ophthalmic, second is the maxillary, third is the mandibular. The ophthalmic carries the general, uh, general sensation of touch pain from the forehead, scalp, and cornea. Maxillary from the palate, nasal cavity, maxillary face, and maxillary teeth. And the mandibular, it carries the anterior two third of tongue, mandibular face, and mandibular teeth. Motor is to the muscle of uh, mastication and anterior belly of digastric, mylohyoid, tensor villi palatini. Very important. Now, legion of the V1 will cause the general sensation in the for loss of the forehead and scalp, as well as the blink, blink reflex with the loss along with the cranial of 7. V2 will cause the loss of the general sensation over the maxilla and the maxillary teeth. V3 will cause the loss in the mandibular teeth, mandibular area, and uh, weakness in chewing. And jaw will be deviated towards the weak side. Now, we have the cranial of 6 abducen. It supplies the lateral rectus, which actually abducts the eyeballs. It causes diplopia, that is the internal strabismus, and there will be loss of the parallel gaze. Facial nucleus, it supplies the muscle of facial expression, posterior belly of digastric, stylohyoid, strepidius. It is also important for salivation. Okay. It also supplies the area uh, uh, behind skin, behind the ears, and taste from the anterior to front of the tongue and palate, and the tears from the lacrimal gland. So you will have the, with the allergen, you will have the corner of the mouth will droop. You cannot close your eyes, cannot wrinkle your forehead. There will be loss of the main reflex, hyperacusis, pulse palsy, okay? Pain behind the ear will be there and there will be loss of the taste and there will be eyes will be dry and red. Then cranial nerve 8 is sensory. It, it is important for hearing. Acceleration, head turning and linear, uh, like linear acceleration is important. It causes sensory nerve hearing loss, also the balance and the stagnus. Cranial nerve 9, it is for the oropharynx sensation, carotid sinus body sensations. Salivation using the parotid is via the cranial nerve 9, not the 7. All the sensation from the posterior 
two third of one third of the tongue and it supplies the motor sensation only to the stylopharyngeus so it causes the loss of the gag reflex with the cranial of tongue vagus it supplies to the muscle of palate and pharynx okay for swallowing except the tensor palati which is supplied by the cranial of 5 and the stylopharyngeus which is supplied by the cranial of 9 it supplies all the muscles of the larynx it also supply is provides a sensory innovation to the larynx the larynx pharynx sensation from the gi tract sensation from the smooth muscle and the glands in the forehead uh, your foregut and the midgut now that it causes nasal speech and the nasal regurgitation dysphagia palatal droop uvula position away from the affected side hoarseness and the fixed vocal cord loss of the gag reflex with the cranial of 9 and loss of the cough reflex now cranial of 11th it is accessory okay head rotation it will cause the head rotation to the opposite side uh, using the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius which will elevate and rotate the scapula here will be weakness in turning the chin towards the opposite side and it will cause a shoulder droop glossopharyngeal it is responsible for supplying the muscles of the tongue responsible for the tongue movement and the tongue will be uh, uh, lesion will cause the tongue to be deviated towards the affected side this is the hypoglossal now what do we have we have the sensory and the motor uh, neural innovations okay let's talk about them at the level of the midbrain now we'll talk about the medial lemniscus now we talked about the medial nucleus uh, medial lemniscus we already talked about it. it contains the axons from the cell bodies that are into the uh, nucleus gracilis and the cuneatus in the caudal medulla and these are the second neuron in the pathway of the thalamus and the cortex for touch vibration proprioception or medial lemniscus uh, this dorsal column pathway now as the axons of the medial lemniscus they cross the midline of the medulla after emerging from the dorsal column of the nuclei now lesion in the medial lemniscus will cause the loss of the touch vibration position and unconscious proprioception on the contralateral side of the body because it has already crossed now we have also at this level we have spinal thalamic tract now we have the spinal thalamic tract in the spinal cord and they crossed uh, the crossed axon of the second neuron in the pathway and they convey the pain and temperature sensation to the cortex and the thalamus lesion of spinal thalamic tract as i told you earlier it causes the loss of the pain and sensation from the contralateral side of the body because as soon they as they enter the spinal cord they they uh, move to the contralateral side of the body cortical spinal tract it carry it controls the lower motor neuron and the interneuron lesions will cause the spastic paralysis contralateral to the side of the lesion descending hypothalamic fiber they arise in the hypothalamus and they uh, they they do not cross okay they cross the uh, like midbrain and they do not cross to the contralateral side and they go terminate in the preganglionic sympathetic neurons in the spinal cord lesion of this lesion will cause the ipsilateral horner syndrome that is meiosis ptosis and anhydrosis in the ipsilateral side of your face now descending hypothalamic fibers they course with the spinothalamic tract in the lateral part of your brain stem therefore lesions producing the horner syndrome may be associated with the contralateral uh, like the contralateral loss of the pain and sensation of the limbs and the body now medial longitudinal fasciculus medial longitudinal fibers medial longitudinal fiber like medial longitudinal fasciculus is a fiber bundle they will connect uh, uh, like they will con connect the nuclei of the cranial of third fourth and sixth so that there is important for the horizontal gaze movements like for example if you want to look towards the right side of your eye your uh, both of your uh, like eyes move towards at the same time they should go horizontally towards the right side right these bundles they they in they, uh, they travel or course close to the dorsal midline of the midbrain and also contain the vestibular spinal fibers which courses through the medulla and the spinal cord lesion of these fasciculus will cause the internuclear ophthalmoplegia and disrupt the vestibular ocular reflex internuclear ophthalmoplegia there is weakness of the abduct adduction of the ipsilateral eye and there is adduction abduction of the contralateral eye with the nystagmus so you will have the weakness of the adduction of the ipsilateral eye then we have the medulla now in the medulla usually you have the corticospinal and the dorsal column pathway this is the same thing which we saw in the picture okay the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus will give rise to the axon that will decussate in the caudal medulla which then forms the medial lemniscus right corticospinal tract they will also decussate at the level of the uh, medulla and form the pyramids which courses ventrally medially through the medulla they will uh, decussate in the caudal medulla okay and then travel as a lateral corticospinal tract the olives they are located lateral to the pyramids in the rostral two third of the medulla the olives contain the inferior olivary nucleus the inferior nu olivary nucleus send the olivo cerebral fibers into the cerebellum through the inferior cerebral peduncle 
that is very important part of the medulla. So remember olives, pure olive and nucleus important part of medulla. Spinothalamic fibers and the descending hypothalamic fibers, they are in the lateral part of the medulla, below the level of the inferior cerebral peduncle and near the spinal nucleus of the cranial nerve 5. Well, let's talk about the spinal nucleus of cranial nerve 5. The spinal nucleus of cranial nerve 5, it is lo located with the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, in the dorsal position. The spinal tract of the right germinal nerve, it lies lateral to the nucleus, the spinal nucleus of the cranial nerve 5, and it extends from the upper cervical spinal cord to the point of the entry of the fifth cranial nerve at the level of pons. They carry this, they convey the pain and temperature sensation from the face and enter the brain stem at the level of the pons, but they will descend through the spinal tract of the cranial nerve 5 and go and synapse on the spinal nucleus. Okay. Via the spinal tract. Then we have the solitary nucleus. Solitary nucleus receives the axon of all the general and the special visceral efferent fibers in the CNS by the cranial of 7, 9, and 10. These include the taste, cardiorespiratory, and the GI sensations. Taste and the visceral sensory fibers also have their cell body in the ganglia associated with the cranial nerve 7, 9, 10 outside the CNS. The nucleus ambiguous. In the nucleus ambiguous, it is a column of large motor neurons which is situated dorsal to the inferior olive. Now, axons of the cells in this nucleus, they course in the 9th and the 10th cranial nerves. Remember, 9th and 10th for the nucleus ambiguous. These supply the muscles of soft palate, larynx, pharynx, and the upper esophagus. A lesion will cause the ipsilateral paralysis of the soft palate, causing the uvula to deviate away from the lesion nerve. And the nasal regurgitation of the liquid, weakness of the pharyngeal muscle causes the laryngeal muscle causes the hoarseness. Pharyngeal weakness will cause the difficulty in the swallowing. Now, we have the dorsal nucleus of the cranial nerve 10. Now, cranial nucleus, dorsal nucleus of the cranial nerve 10, they are located lateral to the hypoglossal nucleus in the floor of the fourth ventricle. This is the major parasympathetic nucleus and it supplies the preganglionic fibers innervating the trigeminal ganglia and the thorax, foregut, and the midgut part of the GI tract. Hypoglossal nucleus, they are in the midline, just beneath the central canal. This nucleus sent to the hypoglossal nerve that will supply all the muscles of the tongue except the palatoglossus. The accessory muscle, accessory nucleus is found in the cervical spinal cord. It's not in brainstem. So accessory nucleus is in cervical spinal cord. The axons of the accessory nerve, they arise from the accessory nucleus. They fast and they, from the spinal cord, they pass through the foramen magnum, enter the brain cavity and join the muscles or fibers of the vagus to exit the cranial cavity through the jugular foramen. They supply the sternocleidomastoid and the strapezius. The roots of the cranial nerve 9th and the cranial nerve 10, they exit between the olive and the fibers of the inferior cerebral peduncle. The hypoglossal nerve, they exist more medially between the olive and the pyramidal decussation. Now we have the pons. The pons is located between the medulla and the midbrain. Cerebellum is overlying the pons. The, the fourth stem, it is found between the dorsal surface of the pons and the cerebellum. Okay. The ventral surface of the pons is do dominated to the fiber, which forms a large ventral enlargement of the pons, known as the pontine nuclei, which gives fibers to the cerebellum in the middle cerebral peduncle. Now, corticospinal tract in the pons, they are more diffuse than in the medulla and they are uh, coursing transversely uh, and uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like, uh, like and are more embedded and they course the fibers that enter the cerebellum in the medial cerebral peduncle. So they are with the fibers of these uh, uh, entering the cerebellum along the medial cerebral peduncle. Medial laminiscus is near the midline, but now it's quite far from the corticospinal tract. The medial laminiscus has changed from a dorsal ventral orientation to a mere horizontal orientation in the pause, not very important. This one is very, in the lateral pause, you'll find the spinothalamic tract and descending hypothalamic fiber. The la lateral laminiscus, okay, it is lateral and just dorsal to the medial nuclear, medial laminiscus. The lateral laminiscus carries the auditory fibers from both the cochlear nucleus to the inferior cerebral, uh, inferior colliculus of the midbrain for hearing medial longitudinal fasciculus in the midline. Now the cranial nerve nucleus in the pons, we have the abducent. Then we have the facial motor nucleus, okay. Now, I told you fibers from the facial nucleus, they curve along the posterior side of the obviousant nerve. This forms the internal genome of the facial nerve. Superior olivary nucleus, it is located in the ventral part, uh, like it lies ventral to that of the cranial nerve 7. It is important. 
now vestibular nuclei they are located in the posterior surface of the pons lateral to the abscissal nuclei and extended to the medulla cochlear nuclei the cochlear nuclei then the posterior medial uh, ponto medullary junction and all of the fiber of the cochlear part of the cranial nerve cells a uh, cranial nerve eight they terminate here now trigeminal nuclei we have different types of the trigeminal nuclei we have the motor nucleus of trigeminal nuclei main sensory nucleus spinal trigeminal nucleus and the mesencephalic nucleus the motor nucleus of the cranial nerve five These supplies the muscles of mastication, okay? Like the masseter temporalis, lateral dicoid. Then we have the main sensory nucleus. It is located lateral to the motor nucleus. They receive the tactile and the pressure sensation from the face, scalp, oral cavity, nasal cavity, and dura. The tactile and the pressure. Main sensory nucleus. Spinal trigeminal nucleus. They carry the temperature of pain and temperature sensation from the face. And they descend in the spinal tract of the cranial nerve five, and they go and synapse in the spinal nucleus, mesencephalic nucleus. It receives the proprioceptive input from the joints, muscle of mastication, extraocular muscles, teeth, and the periodontium. They all sometimes they form the sensory limb of the jaw jaw reflex. So jaw jaw reflex is formed by the cranial nerve five only. Now the midbrain. Midbrain is located between the pons and diencephalon. It has a canal known as the cerebral aqueduct that connects the third and the fourth ventricle and passes through the midbrain. The important thing is the inferior colliculi and the superior colliculi. They are present in the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. The inferior colliculi is for the auditory information. The superior colliculus is for the gaze. The pretectal region is located beneath the uh, superior colliculus. Now, this is very important for the pupillary light reflex, the superior colliculus. The cerebral peduncles, like the corticospinal tract and corticobulbar tract, they are present in the ventral part of the midbrain. The substructure nigria is the largest nucleus of your midbrain. It is dark colored, black colored, because it's pigmented, containing the melanin. It contains the, it uses the dopamine and the GABA as the neurotransmitters. Medial eminence for spinothalamic tract, and these, they go ventrolaterally. The medial longitudinal fasciculus near the midline. And the mesencephalic nucleus, they are located on the either side of the central gray matter. The nuclei, we have two. We have oculometer and the trochlear. The oculometer, they exit ventrally. The oculometer also contains the preganglionic fibers that arise from the nucleus of Edinger Westphal. Axons of the trochlear nerve, they decussate in the superior medullary velum and they exit the brainstem near the posterior midline, inferior to the inferior colliculus. So this is the corticonuclear or the corticobulbar tract. So corticobulbar fibers, these are the upper motor neuron innervation to the lower motor neurons within the cranial nuclei, not in the spinal cord gray matter. So now corticobulbar tract, they provide the upper motor neuron innervation to the cranial nuclei fibers. And now cranial nuclei, they go to the skeletal muscle of your face and everything. So they supply to the muscle of mastication by the cranial nerve five. Muscle of facial expression, seven, pallid pharynx larynx, 12, tongue, sternocleidomastoid, and trapezius. Now you have the fibers from the upper motor neurons, cerebral cortex. These one decussating and goes to the contralateral muscle. But what happens here? The fibers from the, uh, for the corticobulbar tract, they descend. They cross to the contralateral side at the level of the brainstem. And they go and innervate on the, uh, like, uh, uh, like, uh, this uh, cranial nerve nuclei. But you have to remember these cranial nerve nuclei, they re receive the bilateral innovation. So they receive the innovation both from the contralateral side and ipsilateral side, and then they go and supply the particular muscles of face, palate, whatever it is supplying. So you can see there is bilateral innovation to the cranial nerve nuclei. So if it is damaged, you will have the So you will have the So if, if it is damaged here, so you will still have the sensations because it is receiving the contralateral innovation. So it is very important that it receives the both side of the innovation as compared to this. So this is the corticobulbal tract. So I told you the innovation of the cranial lower motor neurons, it is bilateral. So it receives the input from corticobulbar tracts arising from both the left and right side of the cerebral cortex. There's one exception to that is that the 
facial nerve nuclei. It receives only the contralateral innervation. So you can see, but this is the facial nerve nucleus. It's upper division, lower division. It, the upper part of the facial nerve nucleus, it is receiving both the upper division of the facial nerve nuclei. It receives in the upper part, both the upper motor, both both side of the innervation. But the lower division is receiving only the contralateral innervation, and it is going and supplying to the uh, ipsilateral face. So causing the wrinkling of the face, shuts the eyes, causes the nasal flaring and smiles. Now uh, we'll stop here and uh, we can continue with our uh, ear and the vestibular system. It's not very high yield, auditory system. Okay. Okay, guys, these tracks, they are important for your basic knowledge. So remember them and also remember the uh, different level, what is present at the different level of the spinal cord. Don't try to read them and cram them. Try to remember them in the form of the picture, okay? Like the pictures I show you in the beginning, where is the facial nerve nucleus, where it is, the important part, where is the corticospinal tract available, where it is not. Because there are, you'll get a uh, particular, the lesion is at this level, like the upper, uh, like up, for example, upper medulla level. So what kind of sensation will be lost and what part of the facial nerve nucleus will be affected. So these are the questions that you can get. So you need to remember all these levels. So I'll see you tomorrow at the same time and uh, we can continue with our uh, neuroanatomy. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Have a good night.